So it's seven o'clock. Uh, so we're going to get going if you guys are ready. Ready. Yeah. All right. So uh, good evening, everybody. It's seven o'clock. We're going to get our program started. I'm Arthur Pearson. I'm the CEO of the Roger Tory Peterson Institute and welcome. We're so excited that you're here with us this evening for a tremendous program. You're just going to absolutely love it. The program is, of course, as you see here on the screen, Grizzly 399, her life and the recovery of grizzlies in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And our guest speakers tonight are Thomas D. Mengelson and Todd Wilkinson. So we have people signed up tonight from 13 different states, so not everyone might know about the Roger Tory Peterson Institute so quickly. We are located in Jamestown, New York, which is the birthplace of Roger Tory Peterson. And we harbor the largest collection of Roger's original artwork, films, photography, and all of his related archival material. And we consider RTPI to be the living embodiment of Peterson's famous field guide. And like the field guide, we use art as the lens through which to engage with you, our audience, about the wonders of the natural world, as well as the challenges that the natural world faces, as well as the opportunities for protection, restoration, and recovery of the natural world, of the natural lands that we love. We have three major art exhibitions every year, and this year we are so honored to have up currently Thomas D. Mangelson, A Life in the Wild, and this is produced by David J. Wagner, LLC. And again, we're just thrilled that this has been extended through April 10th. So if you're within spitting distance of Jamestown, New York, we hope that you come by to see this exhibition. This is one of those exhibitions that is vibrant as the images are on screen to see them live, these magnificent oversized or large scale works. It is just thrilling. It's about as close as you can come to being there in person. So if you're nearby, please do come, uh, please do come and, and enjoy these um, exhibitions. Uh, just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, I was hearing a little bit of chatter there. So the purpose of this program is for us, for you to be able to hear us and not the other way around. So if you would please just click the mute button and enjoy us by not participating with your own sounds. Uh, secondly, we are recording this, so all of our programs actually get uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you would prefer not to have your face uh, permanently memorialized on our YouTube channel, just hit uh, stop recording, or excuse me, stop video, and you'll be fine, and we'd appreciate that. And then finally, we hope to be able to have uh, some time at the end for some questions. So if you do have questions, please type them into chat and I'll do everything that I can to get those questions, um, channel them to Thomas and Todd. And uh, again, just type them into chat. We'll get through those at the end. So with that done, what I've done here is provided the websites for Thomas and for Todd. So you can there read their full biographies and lots of other great information. So please do take the time to visit the websites. But very briefly, Thomas D. Mengelson um, is a gifted is as gifted an artist as he is a passionate conservation conservationist. He's traveled throughout the natural world for over forty five years, observing and photographing the Earth's last great wild places. And Todd Wilkinson hails from my hometown of Chicago. An environmental journalist, he currently resides in Montana, Bozeman, Montana, and he's been writing about grizzlies in the greater Yellowstone region for more than 35 years. He's the author of several acclaimed books, including a collaborative effort with Tom Mangelson, Grizzlies of Pilgrim Creek, a story about Grizzly 399. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing screen. And then Tom and Todd are going to start sharing screen to do their program. So gentlemen, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, Arthur and George and uh, all the staff uh, who put their exhibit together there. At Roger Tory Peterson Institute. I was there when the Institute first opened in Jamestown and I had a show with Roger, which is a great honor. And um, I first met uh, Roger uh, sometime before that. And then uh, we uh, were at a photo conference together in Florida 
And uh, he asked if I want to go down to Ding Darling, which is one of the famous bird refuges in the world and certainly in America. And uh, Virginia, his wife and I went down and I, I drove separately. And, and uh, I remember that being a great honor to even, you know, meet him in the field. You know, I, I was on this, in this exhibit with him. I was uh, on a panel with him about the photography and his, his art photography. Uh, uh, really art or is it something else and and Roger told me that uh, actually he enjoys photographing more than he enjoys painting and to verify that he told me that he had both all of Nikon and Canon systems from the 600 down to the wide angles because he couldn't make up his darn mind about which was best so he bought all all of them he must have well I don't know how many lenses several dozen of each 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 camera but uh, that's how we kind of connected because he, he loved photography. Uh, so we went to Ding Darling Refuge, which uh, had a big uh, uh, number of uh, has lots of herons and egrets, of course, several species of egrets. And, and uh, he was, uh, it, it was the tide was uh, going out and there was lots of minnows and little fish caught in the estuary there. And he was having a hard time with his, his tripod and it was all befuddled. And, and Virginia said, well, Tom, would you please help Roger with his, with his tripod? So it was, it was, the screw was loose. I found a, a guy next door. I said, do you have a pair of pliers? And I fixed his tripod. And I set with the 600 on it and everything. And uh, then we realized we didn't really need that long lens. So we started using a short lens. But I saw the excitement in, in Roger uh, with these birds coming. And obviously, he had been there dozens of times. And it was nothing particularly new, but he was so excited about catching these egrets, uh, diving and walking and stabbing these fish. And uh, it was so, so fun. But then there was a, uh, right next to us, there was these two older women who were arguing about whether well, that was an hinga or whether it was a uh, cormorant uh, on the branch across the uh, little creek there. And they were saying, well, I was like, oh, Look at this, look at this bird book, look at this. It's it's a cormorant. And another one said, no, it's an inhinga. And Roger piped up and said, you know, it's an inhinga. And, and, and she had this book in front of her and he said, it's an inhinga. He said, I wrote the damn book already. And she, she looked at him, yeah, sure pops, you know, <laughs> totally discounted him. And uh, that was one of the funniest things I have ever seen in somebody like Roger's background. and. And I don't think the woman still believed him, but it was uh, sort of my introduction. And he said, That's, I wrote the damn book, lady. Uh, and between Roger and my dear friend, Paul Johnsgaard here, um, uh, he was also a good friend of, he became a good friend uh, of Rogers and uh, one of the world's great ornithologists, Paul Johnsgaard. He- um, Join us. No. Paul wrote, just finished his 106th book. That would be even. No, wait a second. Don't get going. Watch your back sitting there like that. Uh, uh, there's some, sorry, there's some chatter in the background there. Uh, Paul just finished his 106th book two days before he, he passed away in end of May and uh, or April. And we just spread his ashes yesterday on the Platte River. Where I know Roger came often to see the Great Crane migration, where I is where I grew up, and um, uh, Paul between Paul and people like Roger and other bird people, uh, and of course people like Jane Goodall have influenced me in what I do. And I'm here now in Grand Island, my hometown, uh, with a couple of friends, Dave and Linda Lenz, who've always supported me, and and I had to come in here to get Wi-Fi connections. So thank you, Dave and Linda. And um, so there's a lot of people I have to thank. I didn't, none of this is done alone. Uh, all my staff and people the, like, uh, all my staff and people, all my and, um, So thank you everybody. And I want to turn this over to Todd. Todd, you go well, ahead. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, I am coming to you from Bozeman, Montana, the northern end of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And 
You know, think about this blue orb that we're on, this time of incredible unrest. They and shut it off, it's trying to connect. Tom and I wanna take you on a journey um, thinking about planet Earth, this miracle uh, in the cosmos with this incredible biodiversity um, that we have. And we're looking at the United States from the air and we're gonna go uh, tonight into a corner of the American West. Uh, next, Tiffany. And so one of the most charismatic creatures on this planet are grizzly bears. Uh, grizzly bears, in this case, Grizzly Bear 399, the most famous bear in the world, a uh, symbol of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Many of you know of Yellowstone National Park, which is at the center of the ecosystem. And right now, Tom and I and millions of people around the world are waiting to see if Grizzly Bear 399, a mother, comes out of her den within the next few weeks as a 26-year-old grizzly bear. Next, please. So again, if you look uh, at this map, uh, it's a map that shows a lot of different foods that grizzly bears eat. But if you look at the light brown uh, area, that is the uh, recent grizzly bear range that existed up to the 19th century. And so grizzlies today, there are just two viable populations in the lower 48. One is Greater Yellowstone and the other one is the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem up around Glacier National Park on the border with Canada. And grizzly bears today, uh, even in the face of uh, upshot of recovery, they still only inhabit two, maybe 3% of their former range. Next, please. Again, this is the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, uh, an area that if you dropped it into a map, it would cover a, a big chunk of New England. And grizzly bears range widely across uh, this expanse. Greater Yellowstone is located at the intersection of Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. Next, please. This is... Um, we're gonna have Tom uh, speak to this photograph, but I just wanna say, because he won't say it himself, it is a photograph that's counted among the finest. It's in the current exhibition at the Roger Torrey Peterson Institute. It's a fan favorite. And um, it's, it's a photograph that happened in old age technology. If you can imagine that time before cell phones uh, and before digital cameras. And Tom was able uh, to take this. And Tom, would you jump in here and, and share the story of this image? Yes, I'll, I'll try to be brief. I had uh, seen a lot of uh, photos of bears at uh, both McNeil River and Brooks Falls in Alaska, which are the famous bear gathering places for bears catching salmon during the spawn. Uh, when the sockeye, run, sockeye are running up the river to spawn and the bears have learned to stand at these falls and, and catch salmon. And uh, I had thought every picture in the world of bears with salmon had been taken, but I was actually on a mission to do a film on cranes, uh, Santo cranes that were migrating through the Platte River where I am now and all the way to Siberia and across Western Alaska. And I had about a week off, so I decided to try to go and photograph these bears and see them. And I thought, I saw this picture on the a picture of the gathering of bears. And I thought, well, I wonder if we could just shoot a picture of a portrait of a bear with a fish basically entering its mouth. I hadn't had never seen one before, but I sort of pre-visualized this, spent a week there. And um, uh, from early morning until late evening, every day was different. Some days were raining, totally raining. Some days were cloudy. Some days the fish didn't run because of chemistry and water, etc. But I uh, shot this at uh, a thousandth of a second on a roll of 60, uh, 36, sorry, 36 uh, frames and didn't see it until I got home about uh, three months later. And I thought, wow, this is pretty nice. And it's become my sort of iconic image over the years. And most people say, oh, that's just bullshit. Sorry. That's just been baloney because it was uh, photoshopped, you know, or he put the fish in his mouth. Anyway, it's, it was uh, mostly, um, what I like about it was, I imagined it before he took it and it's uh, become more of my well-known pictures, but thank you. 
And I had to go to Alaska to, to photograph bears. There were no bears left where I lived in, in Teton Park or uh, south of there because they all been extirpated and somewhere only maybe 130 or 150 were left in Yellowstone in 1978 when I moved to Jackson Hole. And so I had to go to Alaska to photograph grizzly bears and mostly in Denali Park, like here with ones chasing Arctic ground squirrel. And out on the, this is out on McNeil River, uh, McFick Creek goes into the McNeil. And so I had to go a long ways to even see grizzly bears or photograph them because again, they were pretty much extirpated from both Teton Park and Yellowstone in the lower 48. Um, then uh, I hardly ever saw them in Yellowstone. And this is one in about 19, I think 88 or so, uh, with two koi cubs of the year. And uh, it made me uh, really uh, grateful that, that uh, grizzlies were sort of coming back. They were put on the Endangered Species Act in 1975. And the, numbers have started to increase. And, you know, scenes like this now in Yellowstone or Teton Park are not common, but still, um, you know, we can still see these kinds of images. It's a big male that had, had uh, was feeding on a um, bison carcass that fell through the ice in the Yellowstone River, which they do every year. And he had fought out with other four or five other male bears over uh, a female and, um, he was the uh, victor. You can see the little red spots around his eyes. And he was very fortunate not, not to lose both eyes, but he was on a mission following her. Uh, she was an estrus and ready to mate. And then they uh, courted for uh, 45 minutes and courted four or five times. And he came and he just laid by my car about 20 yards away. <laughs> he was pretty, uh, pretty happy, but kind of worn out. This is the photograph of my dog, Loop, who was... Uh, one of my favorite dogs and he was, it didn't matter. This is in Jackson Hole. I just lived just about a mile, half mile from the park, south, south of, of Teton. And one day I, uh, Loop was uh, at my foot of my bed and, and they started going crazy and he jumped to the, um, the sliding glass doors and he was way crazier than I've ever seen him. I looked and bolted up out of bed at, at dawn and there was this big face of a, of a bear staring at him. I thought it was a black bear, which I had was fairly common, but no grizzlies, like I said, had been there for 50 years. And I realized that this was a grizzly bear and not a black bear. And that, uh, this was in, in 2006. So I thought, wow, that's incredible. Probably a one-time thing and just a wandering grizzly bear. But uh, then uh, that's, fall this bear showed up with her three cubs and Todd you know about this I think I want you to go ahead I want this everybody tonight to think about how life events can turn on a single moment or a, a short period of time so Tom uh, sees catches a glimpse of this bear in 2006 and in spring of 2007 15 years ago it proved to be a pivotal moment in the life history of Grizzly Bear 399. And so I wanna share a bear story tonight. It was uh, springtime, there was a teacher's convention at a place called Jackson Lake Lodge, which is just to the right of this body of water uh, that you're looking out here down the road. And the school teacher goes for a hike and uh, an area had been closed because of grizzly bear activity. And he went down there when the trail opened and he noticed he just felt something, a sixth sense. And he went down and uh, to a place called Willow Flats, which is kind of jungly for the Northern Rockies. And he turned around and he came back. And on his way back, um, he was standing in a place and little did he know, but Grizzly Bear 399 and her first major brood of three cubs were feeding on an elk carcass uh, in the brush. And he didn't know this, but um, 399 was going to act defensively um, on, in defense of her cubs and to protect the carcass. And so through a series of events, uh, the school teacher was attacked and mauled. Um, it's a pretty harrowing tale. I won't go into all of it here, but the gist of it is this. 
is that rangers were called to the scene. Um, they arrived, uh, the school teacher had been injured, not fatally. If 399 had wanted to kill the school teacher, she could have. And the school teacher was rushed to a Jackson hospital. And when rangers arrived on the scene, they saw 399 feeding on this elk carcass again with her cubs. And they thought for a moment that she was still on the person who was being mauled. And so the immediate response was to perhaps shoot the bear by the rangers. And, but for the luck of a couple different events, uh, Mr. Vandenboss, the school teacher said, whatever you do, don't injure the grizzly bear, don't do anything to her. And the, the rangers realized that she was not on, um, on a human, but on the carcass. And then the park superintendent was called and she decided that it was a, a, def a naturally defensive incident and 399's life that day was spared. And so what are the implications of that? One of the implications is, is that in a grizzly bear population like that of greater Yellowstone, the most important animals in a population are healthy mothers that reproduce. And as a result of that event of keeping 399, today she has given birth to 17 cubs. And if you add in cubs of cubs, uh, two dozen bears at least. And um, it's just this profound success story. She's famous in part because Tom and I have been able to follow her uh, and others have been able to follow her and she's been long lived, incredibly long lived, but she also has been remarkable. She's given uh, birth to three different sets of cubs and uh, a set of quadruplets. And um, so she's this amazing bear and were it not for common sense prevailing, uh, she would not be with us today. Tom? Thank you, Todd. Yes. Uh and the reason she became so popular, she she realized that being close to people was not necessarily a negative. Uh, like most bears are hunted in Alaska, they shoot about fifteen hundred grizzly bears a year for sport in Alaska. And a lot of the grizzlies, of course, were killed in. They used to be in my my uh, state of Nebraska. They probably used to walk by, past my cabin on the Platte River, which is just west of here, about 25 miles. But along with the bison and antelope and everything else. Anyway, pronghorn. And so uh, this particular bear was so smart and sentient that she learned that being close to uh, people as in, along highways and roads and stuff was probably a good thing. Uh, because in the back country, especially when she has cubs, uh, her first cub is likely killed um, before we knew her uh, by a male grizzly that sometimes will kill cubs and then put the female in estrus breed so he can he can pass on his genes. It's just like the, the lions and leopards and a lot of other um, cats and car carnivores or omnivores. But she became so um sort of not habituated but learned that people were okay and the big male bears kept away from people so she became a quote roadside bear where she was here eating biscuit root and teaching her offspring you know what to eat everything is of of cubs are learned by the mothers you know where to forage where to find food and and what the best stuff is like this, this is a biscuit root in the early spring is one of the first flowering plants that come up with very rich in, in nutrients and carbohydrates and and um so they um follow the mother and it takes them about two and a half years to learn pretty much all they have to know and then they go off on their own and this is the first one of the first major prints that i well the first print of 399 i made is with her with her th first three tri triplets and um only one of these cubs survives today, and it's uh, called 610. 399's number came from uh, researchers who who would tag and collar grizzly bears, and this is the 399th bear 
uh, in the Yellowstone ecosystem, thus named 399. 610 was obviously, you know, some 209 or whatever, uh, 11 uh, numbers after that. So only one of these cups survives today. And 399, again, cruised a lot in the biscuit route. One day we saw her uh, off quite a few yards from the uh, roadside and her three cubs were uh, about 200 yards away and wondering what the heck, and they lost each other, they misplaced each other, in other words, and they, this big pickup truck was running its engine with a big diesel, a lot of noise, and the, the cubs were bawling and she was bawling and she was going crazy, running around, foaming at the mouth, and she couldn't see the cubs for the cars and they couldn't see her for the cars and the tall sagebrush. And finally, when they got back together about 15 minutes later, they uh, greeted each other nose, nose to nose. And then she immediately laid down right there, only like 20 yards from the highway and nursed them. And it was much, uh, it, was, it, was, it was touching because she didn't walk two feet. The best thing is we know as, as humans and mothers of, of humans is you nurse a child when it's crying or it's upset or whatever. So it was like, you know, these are not that far removed behaviorally, uh, essentially from us. Then during the spring, uh, after they, they spend a lot of time digging pocket gophers and uh, winter kills, uh, when they come out of the den and once things start bringing up, they eat a lot of vegetation, but they also start honing in on, on elk calves. And this is the um, willow flats and big herds of elk would go there every year to uh, graze and to birth their calves and everything was fine because there were no grizzly bears, there were no wolves. Uh, they had a um, place to themselves and it was safe and it was like the Serengeti in a way, but without predators. And then when the bear showed up, it was a whole different story. So here she is with her two cubs teaching them where to go. And if on the upper right there, you see Jackson Lake Lodge and people would come out on the uh, veranda there with their drinks and sit and have their cocktails. And, and every afternoon, uh, people would come there like it was a matinee, be about 4.30 they'd show up and about 5.30. It would be 399. She'd saunter out there uh, like a sort of rope of dope. Uh, and the elk would all look at her as they split it up. And then she'd pick out the weakest of the bunch. And then she would race and chase them. And people here would bring their coolers and their picnics. And, and it was quite the scene. And that's kind of became uh, the beginning of her fame. She would stare at these elk. And much, I just came back from Botswana last week. And uh, this is exactly what the ungulates uh, do in Africa, they want to keep their eye on the predator. So here they are keeping, it's better to keep an eye on a predator than have them ambush you in the back. So here they are looking at 399 and she's picking out what would be like probably one of the calves in that group and then chase them. And she could run like the wind. They can run 30, 40 miles an hour for short distances and then take a break and the calves all go in the willows. And then she hunts them down like bird dogs. And then later in the fall, uh, they start you know, the whole summer they spend pretty much on vegetation. Uh, they, they can only ca catch elk cows for a couple of weeks until they're too big and too fast for them to catch. So then they go back to vegetation and then they return to uh, the berries in late fall. Go ahead, Todd. So I wanna ask a question, an open-ended question that I'll return to in a bit. Uh, the question is, why do we recover species? Why does our country spend so much time and effort? Why is there so much sympathy among our citizens for bringing species back from the very brink? You know, it's a question worth pondering today. And in the case of 399 and the larger bear population in Yellowstone, as Tom mentioned before, the population may have dipped to as few as 136 grizzly bears in the middle of the 1970s. Um, the head of grizzly bear recovery didn't know. He, he was somewhat doubtful that we would even have bears a couple decades into the future because they were dying at a faster rate than they were being reproduced. And again, the most important uh, members of a population are reproducing mothers. And so in 1975, grizzly bears uh, were listed under the Endangered Species Act as a threatened species. Uh, grizzly bear hunting was abolished. If you could go back to the uh, Teton view, uh, Tiff, I'd be grateful, thank you. And so 75 bears are listed, hunting was stopped, 
Um, there was a concerted effort to clean up trash in the ecosystem. Bears were getting into trash dumpsters and becoming habituated on human food. And that made them a little more aggressive. And so there was a, a huge campaign underway uh, to try and clean up the food and try and reduce the amount of lethality uh, that was affecting grizzly bear populations. And so today, 40 something plus years later, we have a population in the core of the ecosystem that's estimated somewhere around 700 or so bears uh, in the center of the ecosystem. And, and while there are, yes, a lot more bears today, you know, ask yourself the question, is, is 700 bears really a, a lot? Hold it there, please, Tiff. Uh, we're going to have uh, Tom jump in and talk about what bears eat and, and everything else. But it really is a miracle when you think about the arc of how far we've come and probably the most difficult to recover species, uh, certainly in the lower 48 states, is a grizzly bear. They're fearsome. And as Tom said, what 399 has taught us is that we don't need to walk around and live in fear of bears as long as we have our wits about us and respect their space and we do smart things rather than dumb things. Tom? Okay, thank you, Todd. I'm going to uh, move ahead here a little uh, quickly. I know we're at this. Is a, um, I want to show some of these things. This is shows about the food habits. This is a, this is a place uh, called Oxbow Bend. It's my favorite place. And, in the lower 48 has the most diverse uh, animal life and bird life in, in all of probably North America in a way, as far as certainly as large carnivores. So here's 399er cubs that they're catching and eating um, fish that have died under the ice during the winter time. And once they finish, finish off these bears, I mean, finish off these uh, trout and suckers, uh, they uh, move on again to grass and stuff. So this is early, this is about the end of May. And these bears, are, these cubs, all three of them are two and a half years old. And they, she laid down surprisingly on her back. And like she often does, she can see her surroundings under the predators. And these two and a half year old cubs were nursing, which is pretty old, generally speaking. They don't nurse that long, but this was like her last, their last meal. Next day, she kicked them out. And the following day, she met, mated with three different grizzly bears. And the next day, this big, bear called Brutus, that's one on the right, swam across the river with her and they stayed together for about a week mating. And you can see his size, this is the largest grizzly I've ever seen in Lord 48. He is about three times her size. She was almost 400 pounds probably then. So he must be at least uh, eight to 800 to 1,000 pounds. I only saw him once more after that, but he was a very good uh, father and passed on his genes. This is the map, it's hard to see here. I won't spend much time on it, but these are from my GPS uh, coordinates on my cameras that we, we followed these. Uh, uh, the red line is Grizzly 399 and her 610 cub. And this is 610 at age four with a collar on it. And she had two cubs uh, that year five years, at five years old. And this is the one of her cubs climbing a tree. When they're young, they, their claws can climb trees just like black bears. And after that, they're very hard to climb trees. And here the mother's teaching six ten, just like she was taught by 399 to uh, look both ways for cars and make sure you don't get hit by a, by a truck or a car. And, uh, and then you cross the road also, although sometimes these, these cubs like to play with chew toys. And about a week later, those were her first cubs at five years old. And a week later, 399 hadn't had cubs for two years. And then she came out um, with three cubs. And so both mother and daughter had cubs. And so there, it made world news. This is Jane Goodall sent me a, a news clipping. And she said, your bears, i.e., uh, the ones that she knew I was uh, in love with, your bears made the uh, Sunday Chronicle and the London Times. And uh, she sent me this clipping. And bears have it really easy in the summertime. But uh, from that article and from that, uh, both, both mom and daughter having cubs, uh, there are 227. We looked it up. My sister looked it up. Is there 227 
online newspaper and paper newspaper that had printed the story that this bear and her offspring both had cubs and that became really, uh, it, it went viral. And here she is. And I'll try to get through some more of these. Uh, this is obviously, these are scratching poles that the mother will leave her scent, males will leave their scent. It's a sort of signpost. And the cubs learn, learn the same behavior and they love to scratch on these telephone poles. Summer's good, life is good, food is good. Go ahead, Todd. So as formidable as a grizzly bear might be, life is still not very easy for bears. They face um, a whole wider range of perils. And remember, uh, we said that Grizzly 399 has had 17 cubs and that there have been cubs of cubs. But of those two dozen bears, roughly half of them have died in various kinds of run-ins with people. Uh, some of them have gotten into cattle and been removed for that. Uh, one was uh, allegedly accidentally shot by a hunter. Some have been hit by vehicles on the road. Some have been removed. Again, it isn't very easy uh, to be a grizzly bear in the modern world, particularly at a time uh, in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem today, we have record development on private land and we have record numbers of visitors pouring into the region on our public lands. And so this large area that we talked about before is actually getting squeezed. And in a time of climate change, what climate change is going to do is it's going to alter habitat and the way that wildlife is able to use range. And we know from scientists that what's most important is to protect as many big landscapes as possible to give wildlife all of it. Greater Yellowstone is remarkable because it's the only ecosystem left in the lower 48 that has all of its major mammals that were there 500 years ago before Europeans arrived and they all move freely across the landscape. So, Tom? Yeah, it, it, the uh, last picture just shows how popular her, her fame has come. And, uh, sorry, I'm moving it too fast. Um, and the park instigated a, a bear patrol kind of, it's called wildlife uh, patrol. They try to keep people and bears from getting too close to each other and safe. Um, here is 610 uh, who adopted 399's cubs and she ended up with three and 399 kept two. Some people say, well, the old lady was tired of having so many cubs. So 610, <laughs> that's a joke. 610 had ended up with three and she ended up raising them to sub-adulthood. Uh, um, this is a place I used to go uh, often just north of my house, the elk cross into the river. And one day I came, went there at daybreak and I saw 399 had killed her elk. Uh, one of the big adult cows probably ambushed it as they were swimming across the river. And she drug it up on this bar and feasted on it for a couple of hours. And I saw this uh, kayaker coming down the river and, and I asked him when he came by me, I said, would you like this a picture? I just took a good picture of you uh, with this grizzly bear. He said, nah, no big deal. I thought, wow, I would love to have that picture <laughs> of myself. And she lays around, this was her prize, this big cow elk, and then she buried it, it looked about the size of a Volkswagen to bury it to keep other predators away. And like other, other bears, wolves, coyotes, magpies, and she wouldn't, be, she wouldn't share uh, even a little bit with the poor little magpies that would only eat crumbs. And one day I went back there, she was right very close to, I didn't expect her on my side of the river, considered my side she was on the other side in the yellow brush on the left where she had had her carcass and all of a sudden she crossed the river and I just took a, I realized this was perfect composition with a snake of uh, kind of an S curve and the uh, sun morning sun just kissing the top of Mount Moran and her gesture and and uh this is a year that she, two years she didn't have cubs this is her her daughter uh one of her daughters that got killed by a, about two weeks after this is she was feeding on a moose carcass. And um, uh, two weeks after that, she was shot by a deer hunter. 
uh, on, a, on another moose carcass, which is just outside the park, which is unfortunate. Uh, this is a, a place called Schwabacher's Lander, where a lot of people come to bird watch, to hike, to photograph, and you can see in the far distance there are these hunters walking after a herd of elk. And so it's a really mixed uh, problem there with hunters, tourists, bird watchers, photographers, all around this hunting situation. They finally closed that area. And the issue became uh, after they closed it after a bear had mauled a guy. And then a big bear got killed by a, by a hunter, an elk hunter. And this is the a Grizzly uh, 399 with her carcass and ravens trying to get at it. But the problem is that the bears come in conflict with hunters in Teton Park. It's the only park that has um, a hunt. Uh, and it's very controversial. They call it a reduction hunt uh, because I think there are too many elk. But the problem with that is that they kill the wolves and the cougars and they want to kill bears now that, that roam outside of the park, which is a real issue because they're natural hunters and humans take the best and the biggest of the, of the species like bull elk, uh, which they hunted in the park. And finally they quit hunting bull elk because it's not a reduction then, it's, it's uh, just trophy hunting. This is them taking out the bear that they shot when the woods, which is terribly unfortunate inside the park. And the uh, park hunters line up. Uh, this is a Kelly village in the background, and they do a, do a firing line in this um, along the road here. And the, uh, their other partners will sometimes chase you out, out of the closed area in the park to the open area where you can shoot them. But you can see this is no sport. Todd and I both grew up hunting, and uh, this is just a slaughter, and it uh, causes conflict with with humans and bears, of course, because they come in want their Want the bears also want their kills. Uh, not only the hunting is an issue, but uh, this is a, a problem that just naturally caused. This is a bear called Snowy, one of 399's single cubs. Snowy was named after it was because it was very light, uh, like snow, I guess, not that light, but she uh, didn't have siblings. So she was very tight with her mother and followed her closely. And one day, um, uh, Snowy and mom were walking across the highway in mid-June and uh, Snowy got run over by a hit and run driver. It didn't stop. And 399 went to the middle of the yellow line to collect Snowy in her mouth and her dead little body and carried her into the woods and later next to a log and then ran up and down the highway as if she didn't uh, know what happened to Snowy as much again like humans might mourn or whatever. And I don't think anything's wrong with being anthropomorphic. They have the same feelings and sentience and intelligence and emotions as we do. Here she is heading with another pair of cubs, um, um, walking towards her den. And here she is in the uh, January 2nd, one of the latest uh, times that she uh, went into hibernation and we followed her tracks the next day by airplane. And I saw her, where I figured out where her den was by following her tracks in the airplane. And you can see her tracks there, they leave quite a swath. And then two years later, I went up there and here she was with triplets. And right below here, she was nursing her triplets. This is from the air, we were pretty high up. She looked up to see us and, and uh, the one little cub there between her, she's protecting it from this big airplane, but far away. This is with a long lens. And sure enough, um, uh, three years ago, two years ago, uh, she was considered too old to have any more cubs at 24 years old. And 24 is actually uh, old for a bear to even survive. So everybody's saying, oh, she's too old. She's not having more cubs. I think she's good for another another round uh, myself, but I didn't expect to, her to have quadruplets, which she surprised everybody. This is her coming down Pilgrim Creek. Um, on the same day, she'd come down three years in, before that, which is amazing. And she was trying to talk the cubs across the river. It was high water, uh, spring flood um, uh, runoff. And one of the cubs just thought he would try to make it and finally turned around and went back to his siblings and she had to go back and talk them back, talk them into crossing this raging river. And uh, she did, one of them got swept on the river, 
and here she ran down after it and grabbed it by its nape of his neck and pulled it out of the river. Now that is pretty incredible. If you think about um, a bear trying to keep track of four babies, one of them swim, floats down the river, rushing stream. She runs down, it picks it up by the nape and hauls it onto the rocky gravel bar. Everything's good. All right, Todd, this is her after she did that. I'll dry it off. Everybody's happy in the woods. So again, I, I'd like all of you who are watching tonight to think about that question. Why do we recover species? Why do we bring them back? Um, for many people, it's the intrinsic worth, but sometimes you need to make an economic argument. And in 1975, when grizzly bears were listed, um, they were only viewed as liabilities. They were only viewed in terms of uh, negative losses if somebody lost cattle or sheep. There was no really um, uh, dollar value for them, except in Yellowstone National Park. And in those days, as many people who have gone to Yellowstone know, it was notorious as a place. Uh, Tiff, if you could hold on there, right there, right there. Um, it, and the, so over time, what's happened, I want you to think about this. Suppose that we had never recovered grizzly bears. Well, today, um, the economy of greater Yellowstone, uh, tourism to just Grand Teton and Yellowstone alone, is worth about a billion and a half dollars. Um, the top two attractions for tourists coming from around the world are grizzly bears and wolves. Um, grizzly bears were uh, Spartan in number and wolves didn't exist in 1975. But we've brought these species back. Um, all we have to do really is not screw it up, not screw up recovery and uh, again, protect their space, respect their space. But even beyond that, and Tom can speak about this, there are people like Jane Goodall, who, you know, world famous, perhaps the most famous conservationist in the world today, who has compared grizzly bears to mountain gorillas, for example, and we don't hunt mountain gorillas. Some people think that the reason we bring species back is to rehunt them again. And if that's the case, here's a question for the audience. Today, there are thousands upon thousands of bald eagles that have been recovered in the United States. Someone could probably argue that you could shoot a bald eagle and stuff it and put it on the wall, or that you could even eat bald eagles. But with that many bald eagles out there, many more than grizzly bears, they also uh, prey upon livestock. Why don't we hunt bald eagles? Tom? Yes, this is uh, uh, 399 uh, after she, a month or so after she crossed um, the big meadows and, and now she's going into the Snake River and she, she started traveling many miles uh, in search of food. And this is actually in my backyard along my fence uh, where there was crab apple trees uh, uh, planted many years ago, 100, maybe a hundred years ago by the original ranch owners. And they were uh, climbing the trees and 399 and her cups are uh, in the fall. They spend a lot of time on berries and crab apples, putting a lot of, on a lot of calories, sugars and, and sustains them uh for the winter and here's 399 on the bottom left trying to help her couple pull down the branches uh a few weeks later they, they headed south through through town or edge of town down into ranch lands and they came back up the snake river uh, a month or so later back to their haunts but once they left left the park uh, it's very dangerous because there's many people outside the park and the ranch lands and neighborhoods who are not particularly fond of having five bears in their backyard. Um, and this past year, um, uh, in the fall, she, when the cubs were even bigger, they traveled even further uh, looking for uh, sustenance and 
it was sort of an odd, odd behavior for her because she never really left the park in the fall. And uh, she spent a lot of time down there. So now she's in a big, a difficult situation with uh, spending a lot of time out of the park. And she didn't get into any trouble this year with, um, with the uh, authority, so to speak. But the Fish and Wildlife Service was there. The Game Fish was there. The Game Fish and the Fish and Wildlife Service are again trying to get the bears off the endangered species list. So they think it's been a successful um, 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 introduction or not really introduction, but uh, you know, putting them on the endangered species list. And they went from maybe 130 bears minimum to 720 bears now. But, you know, nobody knows how many bears are actually are in the ecosystem. This is an entire, um, uh, what they call democratic, <laughs> demographic uh, um, endangered species area. But the bears are now wanting further because of food sources, because of climate change in the park itself is declining, like white bark pine nuts, which is a major food source, cutthroat trout, major food source, uh, cut rim, cut worm moths or big food source, we're not sure what's going to happen. And then we don't know what's going to happen with climate change. And that's why we really need to keep protecting these bears. Here they are going 40 miles from just north of my house uh, in three days to their denning area. You can see how difficult it is. They've spent the month before eating berries and, and eating gut piles from the hunters of their discarded elk. And here's what they kind of have to go through. This is an January 1st of last year, um, this year actually, well, last year, this particular one. And, and uh, they have to travel 45, 50 miles to go to their denning area. And um, here they came out this spring, quite bigger and out on the ice again. And now they have to worry about uh, uh, coming back out of the den and facing uh, these, pretty much the agencies who want to take them off the endangered species list so they can call it a success story. Well, going from say 200 bears to 700 bears is not exactly a lot uh, of success in my opinion, many others opinion. And also um, they've lost 67 bears in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem this year alone from, from hunting, from poaching, from uh, agency removals by the Fish and Wildlife Service, by the Game and Fish Departments. And we don't even know how many are poached and are left dead beyond the 67 in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. 30 have died alone in uh, Wyoming. So adding a hunting season on top of that is pretty insane. And why in the hell would anybody want to shoot one of these bears? This is 399's uh, five-year-old uh, offspring rolling on her back with her two cubs. Neither she nor they survived this year because they got into, one disappeared and the other got, other two were euthanized by the Game Fish and Fish and Wildlife Service. So this is what Todd's talking about. Why would one, what anyone want to kill a, this bear, 399, which she would be very vulnerable if she, if the if the agencies uh, are successful in turning around the Endangered Species Act and taking them off the endangered species and without any protection, and shoot them for nothing more than fun, look into those kids' eyes, look into her eyes, and say, "Yes, that's what we should do," because there are too many. That is very sad in our day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Todd, so much. Um, again, here at RTPI, the, the essence of what we do is, again, as I mentioned at the top, to use art as a way to help us really become more aware of these issues. And so I appreciate all the more just asking all of us to peer into the eyes of these magnificent creatures. And it's only through your lens and your artistry that we're able to do so. And Todd, with your writing. So this is how we, this is for those of us who don't have access to this, 
we can still be um, deeply moved um, to um, understand and do what we can to offer our help and protection. Um, I've got just a couple of questions here, if I may. I think maybe hopefully on a hopeful note, but someone asked if, uh, has there been any sighting of Blondie? And I'm assuming we're not talking the rock band here. <laughs> uh, Blondie is not related to 399, uh, but she is a bear that uh, is uh, very special in many ways in many of our hearts. She's a, a small female, very blonde, hence her name. Uh, and she shows up every pretty much every spring for a couple of months in the same territory, uh, home range is 399. 399 sometimes tolerates her depending whether she has cubs or not. And, and pretty much she moves in very small circles in, in 399's territory. And 399 has, wasn't seen last year, but her two um, um, sub-adults were, uh, she was seen briefly last year, but then uh, her two uh, three-year-olds were seen uh, this spring and sometime in the summer. Thank so you. Oh, wrong. And she should, have, uh, she should have cubs this year, so hopefully we see her. So a couple other questions. Uh, the question is, what are people poaching the bears for? Anything specific, fur, claws, teeth? Go ahead, Ted. All of the above. Um, there is, uh, you know, there is a trade in bear parts. I, we don't know how robust or not robust, uh, but in the West, there's also a mantra that exists. Um, there is antagonism toward the federal government. There is antagonism toward environmentalists. There is antagonism toward predators. And one of the mantras in the West has been shoot, shovel, and shut up, which is just take remove bears or remove wolves, animals you don't want around or people resent that they were brought back. And so they uh, quietly disappear. Thank you. Um, another question is related to climate change because that's been brought up this evening. Are, uh, are, is the habitat, uh, grizzly habitat extending north? Are they moving north in response to climate? Go ahead, Todd. Well, it's a little premature to say that they're moving north because of climate, but they are dispersing northward. And what they're being met with now in uh, 2021, the Montana legislature passed laws that um, even the former Grizz National Grizzly Bear Recovery Coordinator for 35 years said would be detrimental and set back recovery. One of the things that's been crucial to this is if a bear gets in conflict with people, uh, the bear will be uh, trapped in a barrel, trapped and then relocated. Um, in other words, kept alive rather than euthanized or killed or sent to a zoo. And so under the, the new regulations, adopted by the state, grizzly bears would not be um, removed, would not be uh, relocated in some ways, meaning they probably would, would be killed. The other thing that's really important to point out that is related to climate change, and this is something that Tom and I discuss a lot, uh, there is a scientist named David Mattson who is a, a bear researcher uh, climate change is impacting, for example, white bark pine trees, which produce tiny cones, highly nutritious. That forest has largely gone away in climate change due to a number of factors. Another thing is grizzly bears eat army cutworm moths and army cutworm moths feed upon the nectar of mountain wildflowers. Alpine environments are, are under siege from climate change. Um, there are a number of things that are happening. Uh, hundreds of bears would feast on um, uh, cutthroat trout in Yellowstone Lake. Somebody or, or something resulted in lake trout being or, or being illegally stocked into Yellowstone Lake in the center of the park. And that has resulted in decimation of cutthroat trout, which used to spawn in trout streams and where they were accessible to grizzly bears. So even though grizzly bears eat lots of different foods, over 200 different foods, some of the main food sources have either gone away or are highly stressed now. So we have two things happening. 
We have a lot of population pressure happening, particularly after COVID. And then on top of that, we have these landscape level effects that are setting in related to climate change. There's Thank you, Todd. Of, I'm sorry, go ahead, please, Tom. Yeah, uh, thanks, Todd. Uh, the, you're all, that's all, it's, it's such a complicated issue, but climate change is, is change the distribution of, of grizzlies, especially in the greater Yellowstone, because what Todd just said that we're losing, and according to Dave Matson, who's one of the great uh, bear uh, researchers and biologists, uh, he says it's mostly the distribution. People think we have ear, ear grizzly bears coming out of our ears, so to speak, but uh, because they're showing up in places that it didn't before, and that's not that's not the truth. They're, they're realistically, the population of grizzly bears has not really increased, other than doubling or maybe maybe even tripling, but certainly not quintupling or tupling. And and uh, he's kept these records for the last twenty years. At best, they, the population is leveled out, and any other additional uh, killing of bears would be detrimental to the to uh, the bear population and be back right where we might be. That's Dave Matson's take on it, and I, I trust his his biology and his he's a great statistician. But uh, they're moving out because of loss of white bark pine nuts, because of trout, like Todd said, and because of climate change in general. But they're not the population is. It's not increasing, it's just moving because of this loss of resources. And we don't know what's going to happen in the future with climate change. The other thing, there seems to be this hate culture, which we all know of. Um, some of the same people that probably climbed the stairs of the Capitol. Uh, they don't like bears either, I suppose. I'm not sure. But um, it's that culture of hate, uh, what we don't, which are more powerful than us. Grizzlies, cougars, wolves, um, and that's hard to get around. But the governor, new governor of, of Montana, set a trap for wolves uh, just out of the border of Yellowstone last year, and left the wolf in the trap for some days. It was a colored wolf with um, a, a lot of research behind it. It was a Yellowstone wolf, a famous wolf, and. He went up and shot the wolf point blank in the trap. That's the governor of Montana. And then he killed a cougar on top of it to show that he is so much about macho machismo hatred by people who want to control animals that are bigger and probably much better than them. And then we have the Wyoming governor who is the same way, Governor Gordon, who wants to put the bears back on endangered species list, as is the Idaho governor. So all three states that should be celebrating 399 and, and wolves, reintroduction of wolves and cougars are all hateful of big predators. And that's a real problem. Thank you, Tom. Uh, it is 8.02. Um, if folks want to stick around for a few more minutes, I'm going to put one more question to Tom because it turns back to Art here a little bit. Um, and then I've got a final couple of slides because speaking of cougars, we want to let people know about the Cougar program that we're doing, that Tom is the co-founder of the Cougar Fund. So if you just stick with us, we'll give you a quick 30 seconds on that. But the question for Tom is, what size lens are you shooting with, for example, on the photo currently on screen? That's a 600 millimeter with a 2X extender. So 1200 millimeter. For non-technical people, how far away would you be in, able, in, in order to get a shot like this? It's about 110 yards. Okay, thank you. So Tiffany or Tom, if you would stop sharing screen, please. We're gonna bring up the other screen real quickly. And again, if folks wanna just hang with us for one or two more minutes, we're gonna give you, I think, some important previews that you're really going to enjoy. So I'm gonna start with this screen here. Hang on, there we go. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, oops, next, next year. Uh, so Tom is also uh, passionate as he is about bears. He's also passionate about cougars. And he just mentioned that there are those who are still uh, pursuing cougars that also have their own challenges. So this is one of Thomas's uh, photographs here. And on March 29th, our own George Harper, our director of uh, development and communications, who's also a PhD in biology. Um, he's gonna be leading this conversation with some of the current leaders of the Cougar Fund. 
So if you enjoyed this evening's conversation, please go to our website, sign up for this program. I think you're going to like it just as much. Um, when the Thomas Mengelson exhibition moves on to its next location, our next exhibition is going to open April 27th, and this is going to be a stunner as well. So this will be the first time that the field guide art of Roger Tory Peterson um, is, ex is exhibited and in conversation with the field guide art of David Allen Sibley. And for the birders amongst us, these are the two more popular, the two most popular field guide artists that we have with us still today. Roger, after 90 years, is still a top seller. And of course, David Sibley's uh, bird books are extraordinarily popular as well. So we're gonna be hosting this exhibition beginning in April of this year. And then finally, to get caught up on all of our exhibitions and all of our programs, please visit our website. We've got a lot of great stuff there. Um, rtpi.org is our website address. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Todd, Tom, thank you for your extraordinary work. Thanks for a great program. We look forward to seeing you um, out west soon. I need to get out there. You need to come out soon. Thank you so much, Arthur. Okay. Thank you for anybody who's thank tuned in here. Thank you, Arthur. And for viewers, support RTPI. It's a great institution. So you won't put in a plug, Arthur, but I will. I will too. Okay. I'm, I'm be part thank, of it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Take care now. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Good night. Good night. R T P I.